thank you, Carlos, uh, for doing this. Um, um, for for uh, the World Anti-Corruption Day, we're trying to understand a little bit more from the global context about what's happening as we're coming out of COVID and what's happening with regard to things like corruption uh, management around things like procurement, as we're seeing the world is moving to more agile and faster procurement processes. Um, and we're seeing challenges everywhere with these emergency procurement procedures. What's your view on what you think is going to happen in the next two or three years with regard to uh, measures taken to try and manage corruption in these uh, dynamic situations? Yeah, no, thanks, Khalid. I think the the the, the crisis of the pandemic has, has been a, quite challenging, uh, especially around procurement and emergency procurement to respond to the crisis in the in the most opportune way and to purchase the medical equipments and the medical uh, goods that were required. Uh, but it also just like also uh, show a lot of risks that were still uh, uh, very present, especially in emergency procurement. And we've seen in a lot of countries where you had cases of corruptions around, uh, including vaccinations, but also medical equipments. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that shows you know the, the the continuing risk in procurement systems, especially on the emergency uh, um, uh, arrangement. But on the good part of it is that also shown the ability of a lot of uh, integrity actors and integrity agencies to um, to uh, to uh, to discover uh, corrup corruption risk and including corruption cases in those emergency procurements. And for example, in Latin America, you had several cases where. Um, irregularities were found in a very short time, very uh, quickly. So the good thing is that also the acceleration of the digitalization of the procurement systems and the procurement bidding uh, processes and all the data around uh, procurement systems has, has been much more um, uh, uh, available for integrity actors to uh, act and use them in a more uh, immediate way. And I think that's the positive thing in terms of um, one of the consequences of the pandemic has been the acceleration in the digitalization of a lot of processes around procurement in particular, but also the ability to mine and to use uh, the data that is generated by those uh, uh, e procurement system to uh, prevent corruption and to raise uh, red flags in, the, in those systems. So on one hand, much the challenges uh, remain, especially around emergency procurement. But on the uh, on the other hand, the ability of integrity actors to uh, to use that information, to use that data, to uh, um, to uncover corruption risk or uncover corruption has been also faster. And I think that's what is going to set the tone for the next uh, few years in terms of the abilities of the integrity actors, in part, and in particular audit agencies and procurement agencies to use the wealth of data that is being generated by the digitalization of procurement systems to uh, to uh, to do prevention. And in, in that regard, and building on from that, do you think the good practice and the traditional arrangements of good governance and transparency arrangements are sufficient to keep up with the way the technology is changing? Is our, are our governance practices agile and, and effective enough? Or do you think there's still more development we need in that area? No, you are, you're correct. I mean, there's a, with all of, with with every opportunity, there's also some risk to be managed and some uh, risk to be mitigated. For example, a lot of audit agencies are, are increasingly using artificial intelligence intelligence tools to use that wealth of data to uh, to uh, to to prevent corruption, but also to uh, to uh, to spot structural risk in those uh, in those processes, in particular around procurement and procurement data. Uh, the the challenge though is, is is relates to the governance of the data, the governance of artificial intelligence that is very much present in the in the debate in the debate currently around uh, issues around uh, security and privacy of the data that is used, especially sensitive data, for example, around um, uh, around uh, companies and processes. Um, I think there's also some 
uh, issues. The second thing is that also the ability to use that data is that you need to make sure that this data is accessible and there is good of good quality. And we still have a long way to go uh, to have uh, all the data that is required for anti-corruption purposes to be of uh, uh, good quality and to be also accessible to be reused for integrity purposes. For example, there's a lot of talk around uh, beneficial ownership of companies, uh, the ultimate, the real beneficiaries of companies. So this data is still not necessarily always available and it's not necessarily in an open format that can be reused. So you have issues around uh, making sure that the governance of data, especially sensitive data, uh, is, is strengthened in terms of uh, the quality of the data, the accessibility of the data. And you know that there are around 30 databases that are very critical for anti-corruption purposes, uh, uh, like lobbying, conflict of interest, uh, uh, other types of registries around uh, beneficial ownership. I think the other issue that is also uh, quite challenging also in terms of uh, the role of uh, a new role for audit agencies in that domain is about the regulation of these new technologies, in particular artificial intelligence. There's a lot of debate, for example, around the good responsible and ethical use of artificial intelligence tools in general in by the, the economic actors. But there's also increasingly the discussions around the use of those tools in for by the public sector itself. And in that case, audit agencies also have a, a good, uh, an important uh, role to have in terms of the regulation and the auditing of that the, that these are these tools are done correctly. For example, around the auditing algorithms that are used by different actors to make sure that they comply with the ethical standards that are being put into place. And that's quite fascinating in terms of new challenges that are opening in terms of the role of different actors uh, to ensure integrity also in the tech, the new technologies, the new, new technology tools. Uh, I think that will be the frontier and, and the next stage also in terms of thinking about the role of these uh, integrity actors in ensuring the integrity of those uh, tools and how they are used in the public sector, in particular artificial intelligence. I think that's absolutely um, right. And there's just one of the big picture dimension I want to bring in and get your view on um, in regard to we've just come out of uh, COP26 back here in the UK and there's been a big commitment now to a well, hundred billion dollars a year to be made available to get countries to the right place to get to that net carbon zero and to manage the climate emergency that I think is now generally accepted to be a question of um, uh, when rather than should we. I think that's been a movement globally towards the idea that we do need to do something about this climate emergency. But again, this now brings in that interesting area that you, you've, you alluded to to a certain extent of bringing public and private sector together. We're talking about big investments, getting it right first time, because if you have a huge infrastructure project and you have problems with things like corruption at the outset, it, it, you know, you might not get a second chance at some of these big programs. Is it is this is there some thoughts you have in that space about where we're going and how we can work with the private sector? And again, you mentioned beneficial ownership and things like that. But how how does government work with the with big multinational companies who, let's be honest, sometimes have more capacity than the governments themselves? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And and you raise an important question also in terms of, you know, how uh, corruption matters to tackle uh, climate change. I think that's the fundamental question because uh, I I think that to tackle climate change, you need to, uh, to, to tackle corruption as well, because a lot of industries uh, and sectors that are very important for mitigating climate change, for example, the extractive industries are, are also those that are more exposed to uh, corruption. And there's an, a, a, a lot of issues around, uh, for example, illegal logging, illegal fishing, um, and a lot of uh, illegal activities that have a direct impact on the biodiversity around deforestation and, and more broadly climate change. So I think there's an issue around, you know, re-engaging the industries and the companies working in those sectors. Uh, the, the mining industry, for example, or the extractive industry more generally, is one of those industries where they have an important uh, role to play in terms of their managing their impact on the environment and also, uh, you know, jumping into the climate change uh, commitments. Uh, and I think that that's a that's a that's an important issue. Um, and um, for example, we also know that the regulatory oversight and the role of regulators in those uh, 
uh, in those uh, areas are, tend to be weak in terms of the ability of government to regulate and oversee uh, the implementation and compliance with the, the regulation in those sectors. So th that's one thing. I would say that, you know, one of the things that we also saw in Glasgow that was very uh, important and a very important signal is the, the role of investors. That is that one way to work with the industries is to work through the investors that are investing in those industries. And I think there, there's been a lot of commitments in Glasgow that were made by investors, uh, by asset managers, by um, different type of um, big investment firms in terms of also being a carbon neutral in the uh, in the in the way they will invest in those industries uh, one of the work that uh, in the world economic forum that also we we take uh, forward is to make sure that we engage with the investors so that they also have uh, take into consideration corruption risk in the way in the decisions to invest and one of the uh, important debate that is ongoing is around ESG standards environment social and governance standards that are guiding investors in their investment investment decision but in the ESG uh, the G tends to be the weakest link uh, so far in terms of uh, how investors are, are, are making decisions on on how uh, investing or disinvesting in some industries uh, and I think there needs to be more work around uh, uh, you know strengthening the G in the ESG investing space uh, and in particular um, taking into consideration that corruption has really an impact on both the ESG but in particular in the G or standards if you will and there's a lot of movement uh, among investors to take that into consideration so one of the ways that um, governments also can work is, is 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 also raising the game and raising the bar in terms of the standards, the international standards around responsible investing, uh, ethical investing that includes investing in in those industries that are more prone to uh, corruption or that are more exposed to corruption and that have a direct in bearing on climate change or climate mitigation. Um, I think that's a, that's a very exciting way also and a, a, a space to uh, to look into in terms of uh, responsible investing in the way uh, these decisions are made. We see, for example, a number of uh, sovereign wealth funds that are already taking that on board. The, so the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, for example, is, is already starting to take into account both uh, environmental consideration, but increasingly uh, corruption risk in their uh, decisions to invest in companies or disinvest in other companies and uh, investors such, such as SoftBank and others uh, have also made these commitments in, in Glasgow to be more responsible in the way they invest and that may be a way to also um, uh, level mo the playing field between uh, multinational corporations operating in different countries and and uh, you know working with the, the investors uh, uh, the investors. Uh, the, the the case of the sovereign wealth fund is quite interesting because a lot of them are also uh, co uh, funds that are financed by uh, uh, resource-rich countries, uh, precisely that are in the in sectors. You know, they generated these sovereign wealth funds from industries that were maybe more uh, prone to um, to impact on climate change. Uh, but there's a, there's been a lot of uh, signals from Glasgow, from the investors community about some of the principles that they're trying to 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 take on uh, to change uh, those incentives. It it is nice, isn't it, that there's integrated thinking is coming and and doing the right thing is now becoming seen as being also economic sense as well as social sense and and in in all ways in in your career do you, do you think we are entering based on what you've seen before as well do you think we are entering a new kind of uh shift towards more community and more more um, integrity based decision making or do you think we're just greenwashing and whitewashing and other washing everything uh, no, that's a very good question in terms of you know whether this is greenwashing or this is corruption washing uh, that is going on. I'm I'm more po optimistic and positive in that sense because the 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 level and the type of discussions you have in uh, forums that were not necessarily uh, uh, having this kind of discussions 10 or 15 years ago are taking place, and that's why, for example, this the case of the investors and the investing industry, that is uh, that is really one of the big incentives in terms of how companies um, and multinationals are behaving and, and therefore I think there's a you know there's a genuine wave and genuine commitment by uh, 
um, by those actors, by by investors, but also some global companies in terms of uh, their uh, you know responsibility and corporate responsibility in in the sense of being a a, a, a stakeholder rather than also a shareholder uh, in in the economy. So I think that's that's positive signs. I think there's much more to be done in terms of uh, making things happen and, and concretely translating commitments into actions. Uh, uh, but I think the, uh, the 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 direction is the right one. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, really appreciate your insights and. Um, I'm sure we, we'll reflect on them in, as we move over to the panel discussion later. So thank you very much for your, your, your time there, Carlos. Oh, thank you. And thank you. Always a pleasure to collaborate with SIPFA.